Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help executives thrive as cyber risk managers. Your hosts are Kip Boyle, CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities, and Jake Bernstein, Cybersecurity Counsel at the law firm of Newman DeWars. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about how cyber insurance actually works, and we're going to do that with the help of a guest. Oh, a guest. Who is it today? All right. So I'm so pleased. We have Peter Marshall with us. He's the president of Marshall and Associates, which is a risk consulting firm that he founded and leads. And you'll like this, Jake. He's a former trial lawyer. So Peter, welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much. I think our listeners are going to really enjoy this episode because Peter has some great stories to tell us about actual claims that he's worked. Yes, uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, when you have actual uh, payments on claims. And so we'll be talking about that today and how the policy responds. So, Peter, I'm curious. Um, tell us a little bit, a bit about your background as an attorney, uh, how you uh, switched from being a trial lawyer to going into the insurance business. Sure. Uh, I was hired in-house as a trial attorney attorney for Safeco Insurance Company uh, back in 1990 and was a defense attorney defending insureds uh, for Safeco for about seven years and then transferred into the corporate department and oversaw bad faith litigation against the company as as well as uh, several different corporate issues. In uh, 2000 and um, excuse me, 1997, I was offered a job working for uh, Crump, or excuse me, um, Sedgwick James. And Sedgwick James was the third largest insurance brokerage firm at that time, and that's how I really got into insurance and placement of policies and working with insureds. Well, very cool. And so you've been doing this for a long time now with insurance one way or the other then? Yes. Oh, man. You, I don't think we have enough time in the episode to hear all the truly great stories you probably have to tell, <laughs> but I'm glad we're going to hear some of them. <laughs> um, so let's get right to it. So, Peter, um, a, as an expert in corporate insurance, uh, will you tell our listeners what they need to know about how cyber insurance actually works? Sure, sure. Uh, one of the most difficult things things about cyber insurance is it is a constantly moving target. Um, We see new uh, methods of attack against insureds uh, happening uh, on a weekly basis. And as a result of that, the insurance policies need to keep up. And what I mean by that is uh, extortion and ransomware. You know, 10 years ago or even five years ago, it was not that big a deal. But today it's it's a very important coverage to have in your policy. What also makes insurance policies difficult in the cyber realm is the fact that no two policies are the same. It's unlike your home or auto, which has similar uh, what's called ISO language, which has been approved by an insurance commissioner and used throughout uh, the country. Cyber insurance is kind of like the wild west of insurance. And so you've got a lot of different uh, changes happening and you've got a lot of policies that are being created, uh, which, which are called non-admitted policies by London and, and other markets. Hmm. Wow. Um, so we've, uh, we had a guest on a little while ago. His name is Chris Brumfield. He works for an, uh, an independent uh, insurance broker. And he was kind of talking about some of this stuff. Um, is, is your company also a insurance broker? Our company does three things. Uh, based on um, my background and experience, we are an excess surplus lines broker. Uh, basically, we're a broker's broker. We have um, a lot of retail brokers that come to us when they have difficult to place or difficult uh, matters to insure. We, in turn, specialize in the management liability, uh, professional liability, and the cyberspace. And so we have uh, certain uh, programs and contracts that we have uh, rights to out of uh, different markets, uh, London being one of the major ones. And then we also have a proprietary uh, product that we've developed uh, for financial institutions dealing with cyber and, and criminal issues. And one of the 
difficulties that we see is that with the insurance policy, is there no, there's not a clear line or lane of coverage. So, for example, if you have a uh, cyber policy and you have a situation where somebody uh, fishes you, and what fishing is is somebody basically acts like they know you or they're a friend and they uh, convince you into clicking on their link and you click on their link and then they have malware on it they can do several things one of the things they can do is they can actually use that malware to trick you into uh, sending money uh, to a place you didn't intend it to for instance a false or dummied up uh, invoice well if that happens the cyber policies generally uh, there could be a gap because that's considered a criminal matter so in criminal activity because it's theft so that's where we get into some of these uh, gray and mixed lines of insurance coverage how interesting so let's see so you're a broker's broker which kind of makes me think you're a gentleman's gentleman something like that <laughs> <laughs> and so we also we also do consulting uh -huh. So we, we do consulting for clients that says, you know, can you ask us to review our policy? What kind of coverages do we have or, or do you have? We also work with clients on developing incident response plans. We do that um, for several financial institutions uh, around the country. And then the last uh, thing that we do, or the last uh, leg of our tripod for income stream is uh, I'm an expert witness because of my background I'm hired by attorneys across the country to assist them in litigation um, when somebody's not paying a policy on either the the insur insurance company side or for the insured oh so, so you would I represent to, either I, side yes well right, he wouldn't you. represent either side he would he would be the uh, he's not representing either side he's an expert witness about the uh, the policy in either direction, and I'm super curious how much litigation is going on right now surrounding cyber policies, or if it's really too early to tell. Well, that's a really good question, Jake. It it's growing, and it'll continue to grow because what's happening is as more people are are being affected by uh, cyber incidents. Uh, we're seeing uh, policies being challenged and in some respects uh, we're seeing situations where either the insured and the insurance company never never thought a particular event would occur and so you know they're claiming that it's not insured so yes what we're going to see is increased litigation in the cyberspace as people uh, work to define these terms remember I said earlier that no two cyber insurance policies are the same and that creates a lot of difficulty because definitions mean a lot in contracts and they mean a lot in the insurance world totally so you know one thing um, that I haven't talked too much about on this podcast is my background as a former regulator for the state of Washington. I was an assistant attorney general uh, in consumer protection. So, you know, we didn't have direct um, jurisdiction over insurance. You know, the, the Office of Insurance Commissioner in Washington does that and every state has their own. Um, and that's kind of what you were getting at regarding, you know, the, um, the kind of more typical consumer grade uh, insurance policies. Um, but but back to the cyber liability, I'm I'm also really curious to know, you know, right now what we've heard from other people in the insurance space is that you know, cyber insurance is it's basically dirt cheap. Um, the insurance companies themselves don't really understand the level of risk. It's difficult to underwrite. There's no actuarial science yet that's particularly reliable. How do you see all of those factors playing into you know, someone trying to get an enormously high payout from a um, from a, an insurance policy. Well, I think as the losses continue to mount, you will see that the insurance carriers will start um, narrowing policy coverages. The terminology that we see will start to become more defined, and I, I think it'll uh, become similar. Um, amongst policies and you will see an increase I mean insurance companies are in the business to make money they don't want to go out of business and they clearly will if if they're underpricing the insurance policies that are out there you know another issue you mentioned uh, regulatory bodies I mean that is another area that's growing that we're seeing because um, there's no 
it seems like there's no two states that have similar cyber regs and laws in place as far as a notification. And so what we're finding out is that a lot of the different state attorney generals are using that as a, a revenue base uh, in fining companies that run afoul of their regulations. Well, yeah, and that's not even getting into the It really is the new... Wild West. I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, six gun or, you know, six shooters. And I mean, there's just like nobody knows what's well, going and... on. Well, and, and and we haven't even seen. I mean, the, the California Consumer, I'm sorry, yeah, the California Consumer Privacy Act (CCPA) um, won't be enforceable for approximately another year. And I did a count yesterday. There are a baker's dozen states that are um, looking at enacting comprehensive, uh, or at least some kind of privacy regulations and new statutes. And those are. In some ways, I could see people trying to shoehorn coverage for that under cyber policies, but um, I think Peter, you're, you're as these losses mount, I think we're going to see less and less of an appetite for kind of broad-based policies. And um, I'm curious if you recall. Uh, it sounds like you might, given your your background the kind of surge of environmental litigation in the late 80s and and early going into the 90s. And uh, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I have been told that uh, some very large insurance companies nearly went out of business or uh, had some major concerns because of uh, a sudden surge in environmental litigation being uh, covered under policies that no one really thought would happen one, is that true? And two, do you see any parallels between what's going on right now and cyber insurance? Great question. I I agree. I believe that that is true. Uh, I know that Lloyd's uh, came under uh, fire and uh, they, out of that, they changed a lot of things. And part of that was it's retrospective. Right. So, you know, it'd be like 20 years from now, somebody saying, okay, well, because of this policy, we're going to cover this. I, I, see some of that happening, but I don't think it will happen to as great of extent because what we're finding out in the cyber realm is things are changing so quickly. I mean, let me give you an example of of a situation that I can see coming down the road. I was having a conversation with a CFO of a a bank the other day, and we were talking about uh, some of the programs they have installed for their depositors so that they don't have to worry about uh, people getting in and, and stealing their data and you know how you can authenticate that you have the right person and one of the things that he said to me uh, was really eye-opening and that's that there's so much data that's available out there and a lot of the data that's available out there is from the public so for instance uh, your your home loan can be found on- online and, and the numbers and and things like that so there's a lot of different things that are out there in the public space that the government's actually opening up and so it's going to be interesting as as we go down this road, if the regulators are going to really start uh, hammering companies, if the companies don't turn around and point the fingers back at, hey, here's some of the information that's available out there, and it's being made by government agencies. Yeah, and that just creates a host of authentication challenges. I mean, you think about, I was just going through a uh, applying for a, a new mortgage for a new house purchase, and, you know, as I went to unfreeze my credit, each of the credit reporting bureaus asked me a series of of questions and they were pretty darn specific. Honestly, I'm not sure. I think I actually got one of them wrong and so I I couldn't get one of my my, uh, scores right away. But um, a lot of that information these days is public. And so those types of questions as authentication challenges may not work much longer. Exactly. That's fascinating. At which point, a policy is going, you know, a policy holder and the and then the and then the insurer are going to be faced with these questions of, you know, who's liable for something that neither of us caused. I, I, it's fascinating to me. I, I just think that the um, this whole industry is due for a, a major shakeup in the next decade. Um, I have a, a more specific question for you, though. Have you seen any litigation where a policy claim has been denied because the insured 
didn't do enough. They didn't either do their due diligence. They didn't have a reasonable cyber program. Um, anything around that? I'm sure. Curious. Yes, there are. There's there's a couple of cases that have come down. Um, one case that's famous in the banking space was is called Patco. It's off the East Coast, and it was dealing with authentication and requirements of authentication for depositors. And what the case was looking at is if you have an agreement a bank does with a depositor and it's a small business, their authentication may be uh, using a token or it may be a password. If you're doing business with a large uh, commercial account that's very sophisticated and say running millions and millions through, you would think that their security would be more difficult. It would be more than just a password, more than in just a token. And so one of the things that they're looking at is, you know, the validation of, you know, who people say they are online and how you can do that. Um, you know, there's another case that we're seeing, and, and this is where some of the insurance companies are pushing back, and this is where the language is being tested and, and where, you know, they'll come back and refine policies, is you look at a loss. What causes the direct loss? If, if you uh, receive an email from somebody that's that's fished you and it's it's a uh, dummy email and they say please pay this invoice and you pay the invoice well what causes that loss is the direct loss the person that fished you and told you to send it to this dummy uh, uh, invoice or is it the employee that looks at the invoice thinks it's true and then sends the money or is it the failure to have a cyber program that trains that employee to set, to not send the money in that case? I mean, I get, that's that's a really really interesting example because I think you know for Kip and I, the 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 kind of classic business email compromise what you which you just described with the fish and the send me money re request um, is one of our kind of go to cyber risks and to know that cyber policies may not cover it is, uh, I think it's really important detail. Uh, and I think it's something that it's going to be difficult to figure out. I mean, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier that, um, you know, this is a, a criminal act and I, I completely agree. It is a criminal act. Um, I don't know. What would you recommend that, that insureds do, uh, surrounding this and, and how do you know if your policy is going to cover you for a BEC, which is one of the most common kind of forms of loss associated with cyber risk. It can cost millions of dollars. It can, and actually they're starting to see claims where, where that's becoming more. Um, it, it's tough because when we're talking about insurance policies, we're talking about contracts and we're talking about highly complex contracts and we talk about contracts that are interrelated with other contracts and when i say interrelated i'm talking about the situation that we're doing right now where it could be a criminal act and it may be covered under a criminal policy or it may be covered under a cyber and what insureds need to do is they need to seek out people that are experts that not only understand an insurance policy and how it works, but also the language of law. You know, if, if you have a policy that says and, it requires two things to happen. The thing preceding the and and the thing after the and, which is quite a bit different than the word or, which it can be triggered by either the one above or the one below. Man, my head so, is spinning already. Yeah, we... We had a situation uh, where we had a client that had an $8 million loss because of the word and versus or. And, and it was an $8 million loss that the insurance carrier didn't want to pay. Yeah, and I don't think insurance are going to, um, you know, by default without a warning like this, they're not going to fuss over prepositions, right? <laughs> or, right. Oh, um, but, but these are these are... <laughs> These are critical conjunctions are critical. And I think uh, what I just learned is that I need to make sure I learn more about uh, insurance generally, because I've definitely got the language of law down. Um, uh, but the insurance area is uh, is a little bit more specialized. But I think, Peter, you know, what you're saying is that, you know, particularly with these niche policies that are not regulated, you need to have them 
you know, vetted or read by someone who understands law, insurance, and preferably cyber risk. And, you know, you're one, I'm one, uh, Kip's got a part of that, but there aren't many people in my experience who really check those boxes. No, that's, that's true. And that's, that's part of the uh, issue. The other thing you mentioned, uh, non-admitted policies, this issue is with admitted policies as well. And let me give you an example. A lot of people on their E&O policy or uh, some other type of business policy they may buy, like a business owner's policy, uh, which are for smaller businesses, may throw in, quote unquote, a cyber component. But the right. problem with the cyber component is it's thrown in, which means it's, you know, it's free or they, they don't charge much for it, which is worth that value. The, the problem is, is, is they're not well written. They don't have a coverage, a lot of coverages. And then there's a lot of policies that have sublimits. So, for instance, the example that we were talking about the other day uh, with, with phishing, uh, we had a, a client that we reviewed their policy and they had a $100,000 limit for a phishing activity. And this was a, a $8 billion company that had a couple hundred employees. So you look at something like this and, you know, it, it just takes a higher level of sophistication. And rather than putting the insurance on the bottom of the plate, you know, really needs to move up to the top level because when all else fails on, on, uh, preventing a cyber incident or a cyber breach from occurring, you want to be able to look to the insurance company and the insurance company does two things. Number one, it provides an access to resources to help that business get its, its feet back on the ground so it can continue to, in business. And number two, uh, if it's a well-written policy, the insured only has to pay the deductible. And that's, that's primarily what you're looking at. There's nothing worse than, than having to pay twice pay for a, a poorly written policy and then pay again when the loss occurs. So Peter, yeah, I've got absolutely. a question. I got a question for you on this. So, you know, so we're in the wild west of cyber insurance, right? I think we all agree to that. And so the hope is that it's going to uh, become more structured, better regulated, standardized, um, and it's going to, and then ultimately, cyber insurance is going to be as easy to shop for as today when I shop for uh, coverage for my personal automobile because it's it's all very very standardized. As long as I have the same coverage level selected, I can almost shop on price. But you know, um, cyber is so different because the adversary is changing the way they attack us all the time. And so it just makes me wonder if cyber insurance is ever going to be able to achieve the same standardization as, say, um, a fire insurance policy would. Ultimately, the goal is for that to happen. Um, the question is, will we get there? It may be a situation where, um, you know, we, we can get 80 or 90 percent there and what i mean by that is uh, because the uh, activists that are attacking businesses uh, via cyber continually to change it's how quickly can we change and adapt and actually be forward thinking on different ways that we can prevent that you know authentication is is one of the key key things that insureds can do is um, have good cyber hygiene and learning how to authenticate emails that are coming in and, and blocking uh, bad ones, as well right. as educating employees on what to look for, you know, when they click. Um, you know, if, if somebody asks you to transfer a half a million dollars and you've never been asked to do that before, you know, ask questions. <laughs> Why? Yeah, you know, yeah what's going abso on? absolutely. But I, I just think there's going to be new forms of attacks. And it seems like... So oh, there will be. Yeah. And so it seems like cyber insurance is always going to struggle, right? And insureds will always struggle with the idea that um, they may have a really well thought out cyber insurance policy, but the first time a new attack, a type of attack shows up and they suffer a loss and they go to their policy and they see that there's no mention of this new type of attack and this new form of loss. And is it, and is it really a technical issue or was it a fraud or did we get tricked? And it just seems like um, that this, this uh, cycle of, of insurance keeping up with the state of the art of cyber attack 
is just is going to be with us forever. I, I just don't know how I don't know how they're going to um, you know deal with it. So I was just curious to know if anybody is talking about this yet. I mean, we have. It, it's part of what you and I have talked about before when you look at an incident response plan. It's, it's constantly looking at what you do and how you do things and what needs to be changed. And the insurance policies are looking at the same thing. You know, what, what's going on? How, how can we assist the insureds uh, in defeating these threats? What do we need to have in place? Um, you know, what can we do to make sure that we price it appropriately? And, yeah. and so, you know, that's that's one of the reasons you have exclusions is because uh, they've they've evaluated it and they've determined that, you know, without these exclusions, they can't price it appropriately or they need to increase the prices. Right. So, so I want to ask you another. You know, I, I, oh, Jake, I want to ask Peter one more question. No, I want to ask man. him a question. <laughs> OK, ask him a question. I'll wait. OK, I think Peter may have to come on a second time. Uh, just because there's a lot to unpack here. But here's my question, Peter, which is, you know, you just mentioned exclusions. And one of the things that, yeah, I'll, I'll just be honest and say I found it disappointing was that right now, and I, and I do mean like right now, um, insurance companies aren't really asking a lot of their customers in order to get the policy. In other words, there's not a lot of requirements uh, for the insured in order to be in order to buy a policy or or put another way it's not affecting your premium that much whether you're highly advanced or not at least in some areas and what I'd like to know is um, first of all is that already changing and second of all you know do you see requirements for you know do you see kind of a, a reasonableness cybersecurity program being in place as a ne necessary requirement before you're able to get, you know, decent coverage in the future. That's an interesting question. Um, let me answer it this way. Five and six years ago, uh, when people first started, or actually even later, earlier than that, eight, nine years ago, when people started looking at cyber insurance, the policies, the applications were very long. Uh, eight, nine, 10, 12 pages long. And the problem with that was is insureds didn't want to fill them out. Um, either they didn't have the time or they didn't have the knowledge because a lot of the questions uh, really required, you know, somebody from IT, somebody from the board uh, to help answer those and, and somebody from risk management. What we've gone away from is uh, more cons uh, consistent uh, questions that we're seeing from different carriers and also a uh, lot uh, smaller applications. And because of that, I, I agree with you, uh, they're probably not aware of all the risk that need to be done. I think in the future what you'll be seeing is you'll be seeing uh, questions that probably follow uh, NIST you know, the requirements of NIST, where are people in in uh, their preparation of preparing for that? What do they have in place? Um, I also see, you know, the questions of what type of an incident response plan is in place, because that's very important on how you're going to respond. You know, the, the studies have shown if you have a response plan in place, it can reduce uh, the ultimate payout and the ultimate cost, as well as the downtime of the company. Definitely. And prompt detection. That is super fascinating. No, I mean, that's um, uh, Kip and I like hearing that because, you know, we've we've kind of put we've kind of put in with the NIST cybersecurity framework. You know, I think that out of <coughs> excuse me, out of all the uh, the frameworks that are out there and the standards you could you could choose. I think that one is the only one that is really meant to be fully modern and um kind of something that you can base a program around as opposed to a series of checkboxes that I don't think work very well. Um, so I thank you for that. That's uh, that's a real interesting um, commentary. Okay, Jake. So let's not fight over the guests, but I have one more question for Peter. Um, so Peter, as a broker's broker um, and with your perspective, I wanted to ask you if you've heard any talk yet about best practices and you know, emerging best practices, because I know that that's a necessary step for in insurance carriers to 
uh, to more formalized and more standardized things. And and specifically, what I heard recently, somebody told me uh, without you know attribution uh, or, or or any evidence, but they said that they were starting to see insurance policies, cyber insurance policies, where um, it was a condition for the coverage and for uh, for being paid out if you had a claim that you had to be um, prompt with the installation of security updates on your computers and that that was a, an emerging best practice that insurance companies were going to start focusing on. Have you heard that yet? I have not heard that specific. What I, what I have seen is, and we have had some litigation already where uh, insurance companies have uh, asked uh, what types of, of things insureds were doing and insureds uh, listed what they did and then subsequently a, a loss came in and the insurance company uh, was looking at it and the company failed to do that and so that was used as, as a defense and I believe that's a, that lawsuits um, it's back east and still in the courts so I, I can't comment it on uh, any more than that other than you know insurance companies are looking at it so if you are filling out an application and you say that you have your your constant on your updates and it turns out that you're not that can be used as a way to defeat coverage uh, another thing that we see common in, in a lot of the policies is where an insurance uh, company as a precedent or excuse me, an insured as a precedent to bringing any kind of a claim uh, has to affirmatively uh, do uh, certain things like callbacks. Uh, you know, when a client says, I need you to transfer this money, you have to call them back. In in talking with, with uh, CEOs and CFOs of those companies that buy those types of, of policies, a lot of them are banks, you know, they tell me, they say, Peter, we don't have a problem when we fail we don't have a problem when we follow our procedures. It's when we fail to follow the procedures. That's that's why we need the insurance. And so there are some insurance policies. They tend to be a little more expensive that don't require that conditions precedent to recover. But we're so it's almost a form of like errors and omissions uh, in the nature of the of the failure. Um. Yeah, it, it it wouldn't really fall in that lane. It's just in order to recover under this cyber uh, provision of this policy, you have to affirmatively do certain things. And if you fail to affirmatively do that, then that's a defense for the carrier. Okay, so that's something for our listeners to be watching out for. So we've covered a lot of really great stuff today, Peter, and we're so glad that you were our guest today. If somebody would like to reach out to you to learn more, to have a conversation, how would they do that? Uh, they could reach out uh, to me in my company. It's uh, Marshall Risk Cons uh, Consulting, and uh, we're on the internet. Um, and uh, locally, we're four two five seven eight eight four three four nine. And uh, you spell number. Peter's last name M A R C H E L. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, great. Because I had to practice that. I just want you to know to get that right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so thanks for uh, joining us today, Peter. We really appreciate it. And that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today, we talked about how cyber insurance really works today with our guest, Peter Marshall. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport and should incorporate management, your legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. Management's goal should be to create an environment where practicing good cyber hygiene is supported and encouraged by every employee. So if you want to manage your cyber risks and ensure that your company enjoys the benefits of good cyber hygiene, then please contact us and consider becoming a member of our Cyber Risk Business Strategy Program. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.